Welcome to the Daria. We'll just give a minute for everyone's computers to catch up and log in. Okay, so <clears throat> we might just get started. So whilst the last few um, people trickle in through the waiting room, I'll just get started and welcome everybody to the DARIA series. So DARIA is the Drug and Alcohol Research and Innovation Active Learning Network. It's a virtual monthly seminar program um, delivered by St. Vincent's Hospital Sydney Alcohol and Drug Service and the National Center for Clinical Research on Emerging Drugs in collaboration with Southern New South Wales Local Health District, Murrumbidgee Local Health District, Far West New South Wales Local Health District and Western New South Wales LHD. Um, so we've got um, a broad stakeholder group of clinicians, consumers and other interested people who log into these meetings. Um, we've gone to a monthly um, and we're trying to have more of a panel and interactive session. So I invite you to hold questions for um, the end of the speaker's talk and um, then please do join a discussion um, the aim of the series is to promote innovative practice and share learnings and new ideas among clinicians and clinical researchers who are working in the field of methamphetamine, emerging drugs, and other areas of drug and drug health. Um, I'd like to start today by acknowledging and paying our respects to the traditional custodians of the lands and waters of Australia and all First Nations elders, past, present, and emerging, especially those who are joining us here today. We respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians and their continuing cultural, spiritual customs and practices. I'd like to welcome our speaker for this week's Daria session. So we have co-presenters on long-term patterns of heroin use and mental health following a 20-year um, follow-up study. We have Dr. Christina Morell, a senior research fellow and program lead of treatment and translation amongst complex populations at the Matilda Center for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use, which is located at the University of Sydney. Her research focuses on improving our understanding of and our responses to mental health and substance use disorder in complex populations and developing innovative evidence-based resources to support the translation of research into clinical, research, clinical practice. Um, and we also have Dr. Chris Termonti, who regular Daria um, attendees will recognize as one of our chairs. Um, and Chris is an addiction specialist and clinical pharmacologist with nearly a decade of experience working with people with substance dependence. Dr. Tremonti has worked in major clinical trials for opioid, methamphetamine, tobacco, and alcohol dependence. And he recently completed the world's first clinical trial into utilizing microdosing to transfer people from methadone to buprenorphine, which you will note is in our Daria presentations um, gone by. And you can find that one um, on the NCRED website. And I'm sure that he'll look forward to joining us for updated results um, of that once the PhD is all polished and submitted, I would think. Um, he's also involved in the ATOS study, which is a 20 year cohort study involving over 600 people with heroin dependence, which has given him insights into the health sequelae in patients, um, which they may experience not just from dependence, but from the treatments themselves. So before we get started, please remember that there will be a recording available after this session. It's freely available and ready for you to distribute and share with colleagues, with peers, with your consumers, with your clients, whoever you might feel um, would be interested in um, learning more about this topic. You'll find it on the NCRED website um, shortly following the presentation. So thank you. And I will hand over now to to the Chris's. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Um, yeah, the Chris's are here. And thanks so much for asking me to be part of this webinar series and present today. So as Krista mentioned, I'm going to be talking about long-term patterns of heroin use and mental health um, using data from a 20-year longitudinal cohort study called the Australian Treatment Outcome Study or ATOS. Then I'm going to hand back to Chris to talk about some of the physical health data that have come from this same study. I've been really lucky to have worked on this study for the last 12 years. I coordinated both the 11 year and the 20 year follow up of this study. And it's been uh, really, actually it's been one of the most challenging and rewarding projects that I have um, been able to work on. I just wanted to also start by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting. And of course, recognize that we're not all in the same place. 
the traditional owners of the lands I'm on are the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, but I also just wanted to acknowledge and pay my respects to other traditional owners of the lands for other people who are here. So first of all, um, we are focusing on heroin because although there's been a substantial or there's been substantial international research and public health investment over the last few decades, <clears throat> opioid related deaths have increased, doubling both in the US and Scotland over the last 10 years. In Australia, one quarter of drug induced deaths in 2019 was due to heroin, which was the highest proportion in the last 25 years. So it's not surprising that heroin dependence is associated with high levels of morbidity and mortality and a greater burden of disease than any other illicit substance. In the literature, we often see and hear the term chronic relapsing condition used to refer to heroin dependence because it's so often been associated with long-term recurrence, relapse, multiple treatment episodes and treatment failure. But we don't really know whether this type of course is actually inevitable. So to help us find out, we looked at data from the Australian Treatment Outcome Study, or ATOS, which began in 2001-2002 as a prospective longitudinal cohort study led by Professor Marie Payson. ATOS is one of the few studies to have a sole focus on heroin dependence alone. The cohort consisted of 615 people, which is made up of 535 people who were entering treatment, recruited from 19 treatment agencies around Sydney. A comparison group of 80 people who were not in treatment were also recruited from needle and syringe programs. The treatment cohort was made up of 201 people and they were recruited as they were entering maintenance programs, 201 people as they were entering detoxification, and 133 people who were entering residential rehab programs. At 18 to 20 years, ATOS consisted of a structured follow-up interview, a comprehensive physical assessment that Chris will be speaking about in a little bit, and also data linkage. And I'm really just going to be focusing on findings that have come from the follow-up interview. The ATOS cohort was followed up at three months, one year, two years, three years, 11 years, and 18 to 20 years. And just to um, highlight here that the mortality rate at 11 years and 18 to 20 years was really substantial. From the first 11 years of ATOS, we've learned that heroin use, dependence, and other drug use reduced over time. There were also substantial reductions in risk-taking, crime, injection-related health problems, and improvements in general physical and mental health. Positive outcomes have been associated with more time spent in maintenance pharmacotherapy and residential rehabilitation and fewer treatment episodes. But time spent in detoxification has not been associated with positive outcomes and major, depress major depression has been consistently associated with poor outcome. We don't know what happens over the long term, though, so long-term patterns of co-occurring mental health and substance use are unclear. We also don't know what happens to substance use 20 years after entering treatment, which is around 30 years after substance use initiation, and we also don't really know what happens to people's mental health. At 18 to 20 years, ATOS participants were in their late 40s, which we know is a critical period of transition associated with increased risk and prevalence of developing chronic disease. So with this in mind, we wanted to look at the patterns of substance use, psychiatric health, criminal involvement, mental and physical health of our participants over the 18 to 20 year study period and ascertain whether any, any, demographic, any sorry, demographic substance use or treatment factors were associated with outcome. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Sometimes when I present about this study, I get asked about our follow-up rates. I mentioned earlier that I've been really lucky to have worked on this study and what a challenge it's been. When I first started coordinating ATOS, I was working on the 10 to 11 year follow-up, which was around 2012. And my goal at that time was for us to find as many people as we could, which of course is the goal of any longitudinal cohort study. And for us, that meant getting as close as we could, um, or as close as possible as we could to the um, previous follow-up rate, which was achieved at three years. And then at uh, 11 years, despite having had no contact with um, our cohort over, over the past eight years, um, we ended up exceeding the three-year follow-up rate, which was really testament to some of the excellent relationships that the original research assistants had developed with participants over the first three years of the study. And in fact, even at the 20-year follow-up, some of our participants were still asking how the original research assistants were, who they hadn't seen in 17 years. At this follow-up, we had the additional challenge of COVID, which came along around midway through our follow-up period. A big part of our follow-up methodology has always involved visiting services, door knocking and getting out and about, so the lockdowns really made locating people more difficult. 
Luckily, this follow-up took place when it did, or I don't think we would have been able to find as many people when we, as we ended up finding, given that we um, were able to do a lot more online work. And it turns out that a lot more of our participants are having um, more of an online presence than they were in the past. And when we were able to get our team together in the office, we did a lot of brainstorming, which was really productive. So that was just a little segue, um, but back to our main findings here. So our ATOS cohort was fairly typical uh, of people who were presenting to treatment for heroin dependence, which is to say that at baseline, they were two thirds male, around 30 years old, that had been using heroin for around 10 years. About one in four reported crime as a main source of income in the last month, and just under one in eight were living in unstable housing, meaning a boarding house or hostel, a shelter or refuge, or no fixed address, and that includes house, sorry, couch surfing. At 18 to 20 years, the cohort that we re-interviewed were broadly representative of the initial baseline sample. They were again roughly two-thirds male with a mean age of 47. Crime as the main source of income in the last month had reduced to just under 4% and less than 2% of participants reported living in unstable housing in the last month. At baseline, there was quite a lot of polysubstance use and almost everybody was heroin dependent by nature of the study. Around one quarter of the cohort met DSM-4 criteria for a diagnosis of current depression, and almost one third had current PTSD. At 18 to 20 years, the mean number of drug classes used in the last month was two, and heroin dependence had reduced to 15%. One in seven participants had past month major depression, and just over 15% had current PTSD. I won't go into too much detail here, but over the 18 to 20 years, all participants spent some time in treatment for heroin dependence, with a median of six and a half years of treatment over a median of six treatment episodes. And that includes the people who, were, um, who came into the study when they were in uh, NSPs or non-treatment, a non-treatment cohort. In terms of what types of treatment were being accessed at 18 to 20 years, the majority were receiving methadone maintenance, both GP and clinic-based, with a smaller proportion receiving Subutex or Suboxone. In terms of substance use, there was a high amount of polysubstance use, both at baseline and 18 to 20 years. I just want to point out that at 18 years, three quarters of participants had not used any heroin in the last month, and less than half had not used any illicit drugs, and that included heroin, cannabis, amphetamines, cocaine, and hallucinogens. In terms of patterns of heroin use, dependence, and other drug use, these all decreased over the study period, with the most dramatic reductions evident in the first three months of the study. For the most part, the reductions were maintained over time, with the exception of other drug use, which returned to almost baseline levels by 18 to 20 years. Alongside reductions in heroin use, daily heroin use reduced over time, with just over 5% of participants using heroin daily at 18 to 20 years. In terms of abstinence from heroin, the vast majority of the cohort had experienced at least one month of, or more of abstinence in the last 18 to 20 years. The mean longest period of abstinence over the study was just over five years. In terms of injection-related health and needle sharing, these both decreased over the follow-up period, again with the most significant reductions evident in the first three months. The proportion of people who had overdosed in the first 12 months, sorry, in the 12 months prior to the 18 year follow-up interview decreased significantly from baseline to 18 years. And again, the most dramatic reductions were evident in the first three months of the study. And these were then maintained throughout the study. I thought I would also show some preliminary analyses that we've been conducting into some of the deaths that have occurred within the cohort. And I just wanna really stress again, these are preliminary, They'll be confirmed once we've completed data linkage with the National Death Index later this year. What I have up here is based on a search that we ran prior to conducting the 18 to 20 year follow-up interviews. We have had more information that we obtained through the interview process that another 2% or around 20 people have died during the follow-up period. And as I say, we'll be looking into that more later this year due to the death index record lag. So the unknown circumstances of death and the total number of those who've died is likely to be much higher than I have reflected here. But based on the last known information, most of the deaths were due to overdose, which was attributed to accidental as opposed to intentional overdose, though of course it can be quite difficult to ascertain. 
So the long-term predictors of heroin use dependence and other substance use. Um, in terms of the factors that were consistently associated with these, we found that major depression, detoxification, and not having commenced residential rehabilitation were consistently associated with heroin use. Heroin dependence was consistently associated with major depression, borderline personality disorder or BPD, detoxification, and not having commenced residential rehabilitation. Other substance use was consistently associated with being male, major depression, BPD, maintenance therapies, and not having entered residential rehabilitation. Important to note here is that major depression is common to all three of these, as was not having entered residential rehabilitation. In terms of factors that were consistently associated with overdose over time, we found that overdose is associated, was associated with screening positive for BPD, meeting criteria for a diagnosis of ASPD, having spent time in detoxification or residential rehabilitation, and those who had spent time in maintenance therapies were less likely to have overdosed in the past 12 months. In terms of the overall picture of mental health, um, in terms of severe disability over time, while there was a significant improvement in mental health severity over time, again, with the most, uh, well, with the greatest improvements evident in the first three months of the study, there was little change in physical health severity over the study period, with 18 years severity slightly worse than baseline levels. In terms of um, what factors were associated with improvements in general physical health over the 18 years, meaning there was a consistent and enduring relationship across the study, we found that being male, younger aged, the absence of PTSD and major depression and having entered residential rehabilitation were associated with improved general physical health. Being male, younger aged, the absence of major depression and BPD at baseline and not having entered detoxification were consistently associated with improved general mental health over 18 years. Important to note here is a commonality of major depression over time. In terms of major depression, this decreased significantly between baseline and three years. Again, with the most dramatic reductions evident between baseline and three months. And at 18, sorry, 11 years, major depression had increased, um, but then decreased again at 18 years. Over the 18 years, DSM-4 major depression was consistently associated with heroin use, dependence, other substance use, injection-related health problems, needle sharing, criminal involvement, physical health, and mental health. So that's a lot of things that I've gone through there, I know. Um, and in terms of bringing it all together and what it all means, firstly, the mortality rate over 18 to 20 years was devastating. Just over one in six participants deceased, which is unacceptably high for people whose mean age was just 47. Secondly, over the study period, major depression was the single most influential factor for poorer outcome, and it was significantly associated with almost every outcome we examined. People who were depressed were consistently more likely to be using heroin and other substances, be heroin dependent, be sharing needles, experience injection-related health problems, be involved in crime, and have poor physical and mental health. Now, we have effective treatments for major depression, both as a single disorder and in the presence of comorbid substance use disorders. But the persistence of this relationship between major depression and poor outcome suggests that we really need to be doing better at making sure evidence-based treatments are being provided to the most vulnerable people when they need them. Major depression also had a stronger relationship with heroin use, heroin dependence, and poor physical and mental health than any other variable we examined. At 18 to 20 years, participants were in their late 40s, which we know is a critical period that's associated with increased risk and prevalence of developing chronic disease. And many people were experiencing poor physical health and multiple comorbidities. And Chris will be speaking more a little bit about this in a minute. As this cohort continues to age, there will be a need to develop and deliver comprehensive treatment, which has the capacity to, to address both physical and mental health needs. Commencing residential rehabilitation was consistently associated with positive outcomes, and it was the only significant treatment factor that was related to improved general physical health. This could reflect the capacity of residential settings to provide a more holistic and comprehensive treatment approach 
which addresses physical health of people with heroin dependence. Now, interestingly, while residential rehabilitation was associated with improved outcomes, the inverse relationship was observed for overdose, where residential rehabilitation was consistently associated with increased odds of experiencing overdose across the study period. So while rates of overdose declined over the study period, the importance of overdose prevention strategies for people with heroin dependence can't be overlooked and really points to the need for comprehensive and assertive aftercare following treatment discharge and prison release. And these findings are really in line with others that have highlighted the increased risk of overdose due to reduced tolerance following periods of abstinence, such as treatment and release from prison, and emphasise the importance of providing psychoeducation regarding um, reverse tolerance and other harm reduction measures, such as take-home naloxone, training in its use, and supervised injecting sites among people who are leading, leaving residential rehabilitation and prison settings in reducing opioid-related fatality. While detoxification was associated with reductions in heroin use over the short term, it was related to poor outcome over the long term, which really highlights its importance as a gateway into additional treatment rather than a standalone treatment in itself. These findings also provide strong evidence that clinically significant levels of improvement can be achieved and maintained over the long term, and also points to the importance of the longitudinal research that we need to do more to understand what's behind these turning points or potential risk periods of relapse or remission that can be targeted. Just want to acknowledge and thank the ATOS participants over the past 20 years, the staff from AOD agencies, the NSPs, the NGOs and other organisations who have been extremely helpful in assisting us over many years, locate our participants, and of course the funders and many research assistants who've worked on the study over the last two decades. Um, some references and light reading. And I will hand over to Chris for the next part. Thanks very much, Chris. It really is a chris a -thon here. Um, <laughs> But um, those numbers always astound me. I think about, um, I know I, I, we should be saving for the panel discussion, but I think it's extraordinarily eye-opening. I went to a school of 600 people in secondary school from some years nine to 12, and um, which is, I guess, equivalent number to have started with and to have lost 100 people or more uh, from years nine to 12 from my school would be pretty stunning. Um, and so I think those numbers are really, really astounding. And I, and, and I, we, I guess we should say some of the discussion for later, but I think some of the points about uh, residential rehab detoxification and just a reminder of how this can be a long-term battle. So for those of you for, who sometimes feel like we're not, you know, we may sometimes it can feel tough. They feel like we're not having a lot of wins sometimes when our treatment, it can take time and, you know, and, and everything else. And there is, there is, certainly some good outcomes for people so eventually so there is there's the good and the bad out of all of that that's a good good way to put it good and bad um all right i'm going to then talk about the physical so uh, chris um had alluded to some of the physical uh health issues and i'm going to talk a little bit more about that now um and obviously thanks to uh again to all the people involved in the uh, in the atos study you don't need to hear rehear about all of this. Chris has um, covered this nicely, but um, I assume she would. But I think it is just a nice, it's nice to have the consort sort of diagram that sort of demonstrates um, where the people came from. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a reminder of kind of you know, where, how they were recruited to begin with. Um, and the 80 not in treatment, Chris can correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of them were were, were from needle syringe programs. So, so not in not in treatment, but actively using um, well, either heroin or other injectable substances. Uh, Chris is, again has has covered that. Uh, I don't need to uh, reinvent the wheel. So my my involvement and and so I I was asked uh, by my then boss Paul Haber uh, if I would like to be involved in the study, which sounded very exciting to me, and I'm very grateful for the uh, the opportunity that it's provided to be involved in such a wonderful study. Uh, it's incredible as I go through my literature reviews and look at all of the outcomes that have come from this, how many times the, a paper will say, further longitudinal studies into people who use heroin are required uh, because so many of the papers that are involved in these studies, uh, they're, they're, sorry, they're involved in health outcomes from people with heroin dependence and so forth, so often focus on the outcome. So they're uh, the case control. So they'll look at 
you know, they'll look at people with diabetes and then go, oh, did they use heroin and see if it was a risk factor? Whereas this is a much, this is, you know, for those of you who are invested in research, this is um, longitudinal um, cohort studies like this are a much better way to do, look at it because we can look at the risk factor, which is heroin use, and then we can uh, look at the outcomes like, um, you know, as I say, diabetes or, 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 or whatever else. Uh, sorry, so I should say, uh, we, we only had 130 do the one day medical assessment. Um, that was because uh, for a number of reasons, because um, you know, 130 is firstly a very good number. You know, when you're looking at these things, you can still drive a lot of things out of that. Obviously, um, financial and time, it was you know, very time consuming you know, to do you know, these assessments on patients to go through their full medical history and everything else. So there was a number of reasons why it was 130. Um, and so these were some of the investigations that we did. We did bloodborne virus screenings, liver disease, kidney disease. We did spirometry, we did CTCAs, we did some um, genetic testing, we did some um, immune inflammatory response, we did uh, quite a number of tests. Um, <clears throat> and so, and, uh, so this is for just more tests, uh, the number of hormonal tests that we've done and that I still need to work my way through is astronomical. Uh, I won't be talk, stopping too much on all of that today, we'll, we'll get there. Today, you'll hear me talk a little bit about um, OTP, so opioid treatment program. People may refer to it as different things, OAT, um, and MATOD, whatever else. You also hear me to use the term opioid free. So when I use the term opioid free, I mean people who are not on OTP, people who are not on other prescription opiates. So including you know, people who are prescribed oxycodone or, or, or others for pain management or, as, or whatever else, uh, and people who have not used heroin in the previous six months. So that's when I use that term, opioid free, that's what I'm referring to, and I use it as a way of delineating. So as mentioned, we had 130 participants, um, the about uh, uh, similar levels of um, gender ratios as what as to the cohort as a whole. Uh, 71 were on OTP, and then there's another further person was on methadone, so that left 55 and 17 on buprenorphine. Um, not quite half, but getting up towards half had reported using heroin in the previous month, and 37 met this criteria of, uh, of opioid free, and uh, there were high levels of, of smoking as well. Just, uh, you know, the first thing when you do research is, well, you've chosen this sub cohort, is that representative of the cohort, which is then itself meant to be representative of, you know, people who use heroin in general, that's why we do these studies, we can't obviously get every single person who's used heroin in their life. Um, but uh, those who use heroin, uh, sorry, those who did the physical health assessment were at higher risk of having used heroin, having been in uh, criminal involvement or major depression. So um, the, co the, the cohort that the sub cohort that we've got may actually be a little bit, may have a little, you know, as I say, have more, more of those things, whether or not that, that skews outcomes, don't know. So firstly, um, first thing that we, uh, are, well, we, we, we are in the process of submitting a paper around is QT prolongation and arrhythmia. So surprisingly, uh, amongst those 55 people who were using heroin, only four had evidence of QT prolongation. Uh, only three of them were actually, sorry, correction. Uh, there's only four people across the study. Only three people from the 55 used heroin. One person who had some evidence of QT prolongation wasn't actually on methadone. Um, and when you look at whether or not that actually had a sort of a syncopal event. One of them had had some um, dizziness and syncopal events. That was the one not on methadone. Uh, and the other person had had a single event when they were at school. So not when they were not, not obviously not related to, to any methadone use. So that was reasonably low. Um, quite a few had had syncope uh, and there'd been a couple who'd had arrhythmia. So there was two people who'd had uh, suspected um, arrhythmia due to methadone QT prolongation and have been um, switched over to, to buprenorphine as a consequence. But even in spite of all of that, we did feel that, that levels of QT prolongation were, were reasonably low. Um, and you, it's only a very small association, but nonetheless is present. Those you know, people who um, were, uh, there was an association between dose of methadone uh, and QT um, duration of QT, such that um, basically long and the short of it is if for every 10 milligram increase of methadone, uh, you increased your QT around two milliseconds. Um, so in theory, if we were to whack any, the, your average person uh, onto, you know, uh, well, it's different for men and women, but your average male onto about 170 or maybe even 200 milligrams of methadone, you'll almost certainly result in them having some level of QT prolongation based on that. I mean, that's not 
Um, people, I can hear researchers tearing their hair out at me saying that sort of thing, but that's sort of what it what it means. And I've, I've, this is what I've demonstrated in this um, slide here. And look, this is reasonably consistent with other studies that have demonstrated you know, for every 10 milligram increment full increase in, in methadone, we um, it, we do increase their QT, um, their, 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 their QT. And so that's why you know, often we will do um, uh, ECGs when patients get to levels of like 100 milligrams and so forth. Of course, we may have been missing people who were already deceased. Um, so Chris has already alluded to these numbers. So yes, these are all tentative numbers at this stage, but um, basically there'd been um, uh, the, the, we class, so Chris had, uh, and, and, and Shane Duck before that had, had class, classified people um, into the different modalities of death, so suicide, trauma, overdose, um, disease, and unknown. We then took the disease um, section and then further subclassified that into the probability of it being related to their heart. So we went and had a bit of a dig through the, what, you know, what was on their uh, death certificate. So there was one patient with a dilated myocardiomyopathy. There was one patient who had an acute myocardial infarction, heart attack, and there was one patient with cardiomegaly. So these we these were all graded as possible sudden cardiac death. Then there was sudden death, which is non-cardiac. So that includes the suicide overdose that we talked about before and trauma. Uh, then there was disease that was non-cardiac. So um, as you can see, hepatitis C um, claimed more lives actually than people with possible sudden cardiac death. Uh, similarly, cirrhosis. Uh, and then there was cardiac death, not sudden. So that includes just three uh, three people who had infective endocarditis, which is which is not insignificant. So, you know, what we can see from the cohort as a whole, that's not just specifically people on methadone, but what we can see is there was 50 overdose deaths and three possible sudden cardiac deaths. Um, I should point out that the sudden cardiac death rate in the cohort was fairly consistent with other studies that have done, um, tried to uh, observe sudden cardi uh, cardiac death rate, um, but usually that's in people who are using methadone. Um, there, was a, there was a couple of studies, one from Norway and somewhere else, and they're about 0 0.4, 0 0.6. And sudden cardiac death rate in Australia uh, is around 0.7 per thousand patient years. So we're, we are all at some risk. Um, and so the, the, the estimated sudden cardiac death rate in this cohort um, was lower than that. Uh, potentially, we may have missed some because of you know, uh, overdose uh, or suicide that had been misattributed. Um, that, would be, that would be the main thing. But still, it's interesting to note that the, the, the numbers are reasonably consistent with what was already in the literature. Uh, and I think even if some of those overdose deaths were misclassified, I doubt that there was um, you know, so many that it would even the balance of 50 overdose deaths versus three possible sudden cardiac deaths. So you know, I think the salient points that came out of that is that you know, there's a, still a, you know, a very, very, you know, and we all, we, sometimes it's nice to hear what, you know, to hear it properly that what you're doing does matter, but, you know, the deaths from sudden and cardiac death were greatly outweighed um, the, by prevention of overdose. Um, and obviously the QT prolongation had a, a dose response to it. So I think it's demonstrating, um, obviously there's been a big shift towards buprenorphine in the last few years, but there's still a role for methadone for people who want methadone um, and where we manage the side effects as well. But having said that, um, there's before even before we did this study, you know, there is uh, plenty of literature around methadone and its metabolic activity, and so this was an opportunity to look at that as well, uh, and to look at the you know the heart and metabolic health of, of the cohort as well. So in terms of so from the cohort that I met, the 130 patients, three patients had reported an acute myocardial infarction as well. Uh, obviously, they they were not dead. Um, but um, you know that's that's you know, you know, that, that's um, yep. And then there was another 140. Uh, there was another 42. So you're getting up towards one in three people who'd actually had a self-reported infection due to um, intravenous drug use, and seven of those had reported that that did, that, that had been infected endocarditis. Um, they had you know, which was typically them reporting a prolonged uh, course of antibiotics, which they required hospitalisation. So on top of the three people we know died, it's quite a significant amount of um, valvular heart disease that comes from that. And then there was a few patients who had either symptoms or signs or history consistent with congestive cardiac failure. Um, and some of those were 
recently picked up. There was one patient who'd had a, a, a methamphetamine-induced um, heart failure and was on um, medications consistent with that. There was a couple who'd had valvular defects. There was some patients who had pitting edema and had shortness of breath associated with that. Um, and so, you know, it was a, a more of a clinical diagnosis, but it wasn't clear what entirely what was going on. Uh, quite a number, so we obviously we did their blood pressure as well. And um, yeah, I mean, what I guess the key, probably the key number that's missing here is the number who had a normal blood pressure, so which was very low. So when I talk about stage two hypertension, I'm talking about a blood pressure, systolic over 140 or diastolic over 90 or somebody who's already got, uh, who already engaged with treatment for blood pressure. So they're on, um, you know, an ACE inhibitor for blood pressure or so forth. Uh, then there's stage one, so um, around 100 and 30 to 140 systolic or 80 to 90 diastolic. And then there's elevated, which is anybody who's over 120 that's not in the other two criteria. So reasonably high levels. What was interesting here, and I, I, I discussed this data once with um, a clinician external to the study, um, and the high amount of young males, if you look at that 54% um, in the 35 to 54 age group, so the younger people, had very high, and you know, I've got the comparative for the popula general population, which is about 18%. And they said, well, what about energy drinks? Um, which is an interesting thought. And I can't help but wonder whether or not uh, that may have confounded the study or whether or not that is something that's causing uh, significant hypertension and, and, and um, you know, dysquilite that come along with that. Nonetheless, rates, um, you know, particularly in men, uh, almost double what they were in uh, the general population. We've, I've also calculated the, what, so the Framingham risk score is predicts your 10 year likelihood of having a cardiovascular event, including acute myocardial infarction and stroke. The, if, and if you were a 40, so our cohort, as, as Chris alluded to, 47 years old, you know, typically um, you know, it is divided by men and women, but if you were a 47 year old person without any other risk factors, your risk would be um, and you're a non-smoker would be that 5.1% for men and 2.7% for women, uh, and obviously higher um, in our risk cohort, in the cohort that we had, so 11% for men, 5% for women. I will say that smoking probably answers for the, a vast majority of that. So as you can see, it's 9.5% risk in a 48-year-old smoker and 4.6% uh, in a 48-year-old female smoker. Um, nonetheless, our, the people who smoked within the cohort still had higher risk due to you know, various conditions, so touch that issues or, or hypertension and so forth. Uh, whether or not um, opiates had a role really remains pretty unclear. I don't think we can draw anything out of that at all. Um, weight, so obviously weight's a big risk factor for cardiovascular outcomes as well. Um, and there were, um, uh, again, probably the, the key number is the missing number there in that um, the majority of people were either overweight or uh, class one to three obese. So only a minority, around a third of the cohort were classified as having what we considered a, a healthy weight range. So the mean BMI was 29.1. So that would put anybody into um, uh, into it. That would, that would be a classification of overweight. So meaning that more than um, half the cohort were either overweight or likely obese. Uh, methadone has been demonstrated repeatedly to cause weight gain, uh, whether or not that's um, transient or, or lifelong remains a bit further analysis, um, but uh, certainly um, it was higher than uh, those on methadone was higher than those who were you know, against all participants or those on buprenorphine. So there is certainly some uh, further evidence of the um, weight gaining potential of methadone. Uh, but there was no difference in BMI if people used heroin, had used buprenorphine or were opiate free, which um, is interesting. So even those who were no longer using opiates of any kind, um, their weights were no, were no different as well. Um, again, just looking at methadone alone and its impact on weight. So in theory, for every 10 milligrams of methadone uh, increase, that increased BMI by around 0.4 of a kilo. So if you put somebody on to 100 milligrams of methadone, you're in theory putting them up to sort of four kilograms, um, four kilograms per meter squared. Uh, or if you put them on 125, you're actually going to 
almost guarantee somebody not guarantee there's no this is this is not how research works but it would uh but certainly um you know there's the potential that a participant would uh increase um their weight class by one so you take a normal weight person and put them into overweight or you take an obese patient and put them into class two obesity for example so yes yeah, so so there is look we, we're well aware this with methadone, um, but um, and but most studies are short term. They tend to be, you know, what happens when we initiate people. But it certainly looks like these changes persist for some time, uh, and there's been theories as to why, why that might happen. Uh, at the same time, you know, there's a question. There's been a question in the literature because of um, people who use heroin sometimes being underweight or of normal weight, and then engage with treatment and then gain weight. Um, so whether or not that is something that's psychosocial uh, because they're prioritizing substance use over their diet, um, but also whether or not opiate use, you know, whether or not opiate use itself uh, leads to a preference for sweet and weight gain and so forth. And perhaps the, the heroin use kind of just masks that for a period while diet and so forth uh, are not prioritized. So again, I'm not able at this stage to answer those questions, but some food for thought that's coming out of this pun, pardon pun there. Um, so yeah, and, and I guess what was interesting is that weight gain persisted for those who were opiate free. So it wasn't like people, you know, stopped using opiates and suddenly shedded weight. Uh, so whether or not, and there's a bit of in, uh, evidence now coming out around the o potential overlap between, um, the pathophysiology of eating disorders, such as obesity or, or binge eating disorder and so forth. And, and opioid use disorder, other substance use disorders, and that may be associated with things like the Oprim-1 gene. Um, so again, you know, not really able to answer that at this stage, but I do think it's quite interesting that um, the, the people who are opiate-free had virtually no difference in weight to the rest of the cohort. Uh, cholesterol, and this this um, again, um, uh, so cholesterol rates, uh, the, oh, those who are opiate free. So just picking up on the point from a moment ago, those who are opiate free, free actually had higher rates of increased cholesterol and LDLs. So LDLs being the, the bad one, we've got the LDLs, which we want to be low and the HDLs, which we'd rather be high. For those of you, you know, for the simplistic way of remembering that one. And yeah, those who are opiate free actually had higher cholesterol and LDL, which is bad cholesterol. So again, demonstrating that you know resolution of uh, opioid use disorder didn't necessarily lead to um, you know better weight loss, improvement in cholesterol, and those sorts of things, which was which was unusual. Um, those who are using heroin also had lower cholesterol than the rest of the the, the cohort as well. So those actively using which again is is interesting um, and potentially suggests that maybe diet is you know is to blame um, solely for uh, why people using heroin had potentially had a lower weight. Uh, with a lot of these things, we've also looked into awareness and and uh, understanding of what's going on with their their own health. And there were you know, recently low amounts of awareness and treatment that that they had a, a an increased cholesterol. Um, as well as other things I'll talk about in a moment. Triglycerides, so triglycerides are slightly different to, to cholesterol, but they, you know, they're, they're um, another important um, uh, body lipid. And so there was evidence in our cohort that those on methadone had very elevated uh, triglycerides um, and that the average triglyceride level for somebody on methadone. So remembering that over two would be it depends on where you cut it off. Some people could even say it's 1.7, but some people say it's two. So though the average triglyceride level for those prescribed methadone was almost in the um, significantly you know, elevated range. So, and it's something, I must admit, it's something that I don't look at periodically with patients and potentially, you know, I think what, again, this is demonstrating is that we don't often look for these things uh, and possibly we, we should be doing so. Uh, and again, there was a bit of a correlation that the more increased dose um, led to um, of methadone led to an increased uh, in triglyceride levels 
Uh, if I can pivot slightly to, we can't talk about metabolic outcomes if we, without talking about diabetes. So 12 participants were diagnosed having diabetes. Um, and in fact, four of them were unaware. So this was, you know, new diagnosis, people being told you've got diabetes um, and they were totally unaware of it. Um, and that was uh, usually because they had, an, well, because they had an HbA1c greater than the cutoff of uh, 6.5. Uh, majority of them were smokers. Uh, quite a few of them warranted uh, treatment actually with omega-3 um, and statin therapy as well. And five of them uh, had some evidence of proteinuria on a urine uh, album and creatinine ratio as well. Um, quickie, so quick, the quickie, I forget what it stands for, um, but it's a crude marker of, uh, looking at insulin sensitivity. So obviously when, <clears throat> when we talk about type two diabetes, uh, we're looking at what, um, you know, the people are reduced the functionality of, of insulin and its ability to take up glucose and put it into cells. And there's you know, cross population studies like the ATOL study, but across you know big, you know big data collection studies, there this is a way of looking at levels of insulin sensitivity across that cohort. Um, we don't use it to diagnose diabetes or anything like that. It's just a way of looking at whether or not there any is any evidence of um, poorly functioning insulin um, and insulin response to a glucose load and so forth. So if we exclude those with diabetes, because obviously they've already got diabetes, not much point in doing uh, a quickie on those people. We've got evidence of either non-existent insulin or insulin that's not working so well. There were 44 with evidence of insulin resistance. And then there was another five who had what would be considered, as I say, you can't make a diagnosis of diabetes off quickie, um, but five people who had a diabetic range insulin resistance. So simmering under the surface, there was quite a lot of uh, insulin resistance within this um, cohort. And there was high degrees of insulin resistance with high BMI. That's perhaps not surprising. Um, high levels of adipose tissue decrease your uh, insulin sensitivity, but also heroin use. So um, heroin use um, amongst my, this has been studied extensively by my brethren, the Italians, Viscovi, Passariello, and so forth uh, back in the 70s, did a lot of studies uh, looking at insulin resistance in people who use um, heroin. And it, they, they demonstrated repeatedly that um, participants had sort of a, a slower response. So if I was to give you a glucose load, if you didn't have, if you weren't using heroin and you weren't diabetic, you'd have an, an insulin response very quickly, you know, within 15 minutes. Whereas heroin, people with heroin dependence or use, actually using heroin had, um, uh, a much more delayed response to that glucose load. Um, and there's some evidence coming out in animals as well that potentially that might persist lifelong. Perhaps th these results perhaps don't demonstrate that because as I say, the results were worse in people using heroin. So it may well just be the heroin use itself that's causing that um, uh, lack of insulin, um, that, that insulin resistance. But what that means in the long term, I guess, not sure. As I've already alluded to, you know, again, this demonstrates that we're missing quite a bit of primary health care amongst the cohort. So we had four new diagnoses, diabetes, um, and three of those were on other treatment therapy. I mean, these are people seeing a healthcare professional like myself or others once every three months, um, and we're not catching that, which is, you know, and this is, a, this, this is you know, four in a cohort of um, 130, and if you go, go even smaller, the three on ATP, so you've got three people out of 72, um, you know, and you extrapolate that out, you know, there's thousands of people on 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 um, opioid treatment, so in theory, you know, there, there's, there's hundreds of cases of undiagnosed diabetes out there. Uh, as I mentioned, from those who have hypertension, may, most were unaware and very few were prescribed many hypertensive. Um, only one in four people who are on who are on opioid treatment therapy who had stage two hypertension were on treatment. And I guess what I'm getting at with some of this is there is a tendency for these things to, you know, and, um, as I say, look, I mean, you know, addiction clinics are busy, um, and this is not pointing figures or anything, but what, just if whether there are ways that we can start to integrate better primary health care for those who are at risk. Um, in you know, specifically people with substance dependence, opioid dependence, 
and integrate that care. The, the Australian model of healthcare and the model of many countries and first, first world countries, healthcare is you have your, your GP is your primary, you know, your, your center of the spoke of a wheel, so to speak. And then you refer out to various specialists, um, uh, but it all comes back to the GP and whether or not that model necessarily works for people who are really at risk, um, I guess is one thing that uh, I'm not, not entirely sure is the right way forward. Not sure the best way to, to you know, I've certainly come under fire from people for suggesting, you know, that this is something to integrate into addiction clinics and so forth. And I don't want to tell anybody how to, to do their job or anything like that, but I think there are better ways forward. So having said all that, um, it was actually quite a low level of calcium burden um, in the CT coronary angiograms for people who are in the cohort. So, and that's in spite of high cholesterol, high rates of smoking, high rates of obesity. So CTCA, so CT calcium, um, uh, a CT calcium angiogram, basically putting people in a CT scanner and having a look at the calcium, that level of calcium inside the blood vessels that supply their heart. And then uh, the radiologists take that score and then look at their age and gender and give them a percentile. So as you can see, the vast majority of people are actually in the zero to 25th percentile, which is very good. It's where you want to be. You don't want to be in the 75th to 100th percentile. That's bad. Um, so that not, so those that number was reasonably, con those numbers, the 75th to 100th percentile, I mean, you'd expect 25% of the cohort to be in that percentile, and they were. Um, uh, but at the same time, actually quite a number that were low. So it's the middle ones that were missing people and actually had a lower burden of disease than expected, perhaps. Um, and there was no difference really across whether people did or didn't use opioids, were on or off opioid treatment, whatever else. So, I mean, there has been some suggestion around opioids and whether or not they, this concept of ischemic preconditioning and whether or not they protect the heart um, and stop it from damage and whether or not maybe there's something that they can do to reduce infarct size, whether or not there's something to do with cortisol because it, there's good evidence that um, opioids suppress cortisol and whether or not these, these um, you know, the, uh, the opioids may have a cardiac benefit. Um, definitely can't say that based on what I've done here, but just some food for thought. Um, and look, most of the evidence around chronic opioids um, and whether or not they do have a positive effect is been in animal studies and in post-mortem studies. Um, so in particular, in Marmor 2004, the second last one on there, uh, reduced coronary artery disease in patients on methadone at post-mortem. So that's really the, the sort of level of evidence we've got post-mortem studies. Um, that was a good study nonetheless, but um, yeah. And then there's been quite a few negative studies to say that people who use opioids have worse outcomes. So they have higher levels of coronary heart disease, they have higher worse outcomes if they go into hospital and more inflation. But a lot of these are done on uh, big in big, big data cohorts where it's unclear how much they're using. They might be using different opioids to you know, heroin or um, methadone or buprenorphine. They might be using oxycodone for um, chronic non-cancer pain or whatever else. So um, again, difficult to draw big conclusions out of. Uh, just, just, just so we've you know covered it. Uh, couldn't, couldn't talk about this and not talk about Hep C. So twenty five people had Hep C. There's actually been a recent MJA paper um, that Chris and myself have worked on. So I encourage you to go and have a look at that. Um, and just again demonstrating that there was, um, it, it, it actually with Hep C, there was actually high levels of awareness, but uh, quite low levels of interest in in the treatment of that. And I encourage you to go and have a look at that. There was a little bit of hypothyroidism, very subclinical. Uh, quite a few had reported atraumatic fractures, and I do wonder if that's not due to hypogonadism. Uh, and there was a few colorectal cancer as well. Uh, renal disease. This is the, my current bunny that I'm working on as we speak. Um, there was around 30. So, so renal disease is, and heroin use has got an interesting history and in that once upon a time, there was this concept of heroin-associated nephropathy that's kind of gone out the window because of the discovery of HIV, the discovery of Hep C um, and Hep B. And so most of those conditions, you know, it's not really considered, um, uh, not, not really um, uh, considered a heroin associated nephropathy anymore. Um, but nonetheless, there's some evidence of renal amyloidosis and so forth. Um, so those numbers look bad, 
but if you go through and I don't it's a bit, bit busy, but basically all of those people who had evidence of, of, of renal disease either had diabetes or had hypertension. So really this is reflecting high levels of metabolic disease within the cohort rather than heroin itself. Well, this is how, my perception of it, rather than the heroin use at all being particularly predictive. Similar to that, I won't go on. I might skip over the hormone and stuff. I'm being given the five minute warning, but just to quickly say methadone, once again, demonstrated to suppress testosterone as Richard Hallinan demonstrated in a good, great paper um, you know, 15 years ago. So I encourage you to go and have a look at that. And there's some evidence that um, it's hypoadrenal as well. More to come on that. So just my take home points, high burdens of disease, high rates of easily treatable diseases, uh, the metabolic activity of methadone that we're kind of already aware about. But in spite of that, there was, there was no particularly increased coronary burden. Renal disease was common, but unlikely opioid related. There's some evidence of hypogonism and um, potential adrenal impact as well. So we need to do a bit more on these things. And as I've already alluded to, I'm not sure whose role that is ultimately, um, because I appreciate we're already, people already got a lot on their plates in their addiction clinics, but I think more needs to happen on that space. I've probably spoken a bit long. I haven't had much time for panel discussion. Sorry, Chris. Sorry, Krista. Um, That's okay. Thank you so much. Thank you both, um, both Chris's. Um, I'd like to thank you both for coming along today and for everyone else. There have been a couple of questions that have come up in the q &A. Um, One of them was quite a complex question asking about um, the accessibility of OAT in a residential rehab um, and whether that might help with um, the segue from, from um, detox into a resi rehab, as well as the um, minimizing the overdose risk on um, discharge from the residential rehab. So there was some comments about that. And um, Christina does mention that stay tuned. I think you're going to look further at treatment and the complex interactions between treatments and outcomes. I think, I think it's, a, oh, sorry, go on, you, Chris, you go first. It's my turn, Chris. Go on. Okay. Um, give me a minute. I was just going to say that I think, it, I mean, treatment is so complex, particularly in this cohort where we have, you know, 600 people who are in and out of treatment modality, sometimes a couple of days, and then move on to a different treatment and then a day or a couple more. Um, and just keeping track of that over time was difficult in itself. Mm -hmm. So we were not able to compare them against each other. We have track them as best we can and we are going to look into that in more detail very soon we just haven't done that yet um but we probably will not be we won't be able to compare them against each other it's not that kind of a study but leaves maybe a bit of a vacuum for some more of that information to come across through other data sets um yeah. there was also a sort of a, a bit more of a comment from a paramedic in the northern territory in darwin who's commented on um being able to see on the front line a lot of the comorbidities in the clients who um, the paramedic that's made the comment is seeing on call-outs. Um, and they've also commented anecdotally that what they've seen recently is um, an increase in heroin use amongst um, clients that they're being called to see or patients that they're um, encountering in their role. Um, they've asked if we could suggest any reasons why perhaps there's an uptick in heroin. I think there's a much bigger complex um, commentary there around um, availability and different market conditions, etc. Um, and I think that a useful resource there would be the Drug Trends Project um, that you can access through the NDARC website. And I think that there's been a, um, a reference left there by Christina for that comment. We also had one other question just asking about the presence of BPD in the screened participants. Christina, just around whether um, those were uh, differentiated between gender, um, whether there was more females or males presenting with the BPD, um, and just sort of the overall prevalence of BPD on your screener in the cohort. Um, let me just have a look again. Sorry, I cannot remember males That's and females okay. off the top of my head. Um, but I can put the link to the paper in my in the chat. This is clearly a question that I was not prepared for, and I'm apologizing That's okay. for that. Um, That's fine. Sorry, the paper what's is the a good reference again? point. Just about the prevalence of BPD amongst the cohort and whether that was differentiated between gender or sex. It was, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Let me put the link to the paper in the chat. Wonderful. Just very quickly. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, fantastic. I'd like to thank everyone for coming along today. And I'd just like to um, just mention next month's um, Daria will be on psychosocial interventions for families of people with substance use disorder or people who use substances. Um, and so that'll be the August session. Uh, please do look out for the comms around that um, coming to your inbox soon. Um, thank you everybody for spending the time with us today. Please do feel free to share um, these data with your peers, your clients, um, and anyone else who you feel may be interested or appropriate. Um, the Daria website is updated shortly following the meeting. And so this um, webinar will be available for dissemination following this afternoon. And thank you again to our um, co-presenters, Chris and Christina. Have a lovely afternoon and have a good week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Take care.